Ett fängelse är bara en plats där brottslingar fostras. To this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall podcast, which is one of the best podcasts round, because I said so. Um, I thought that the gardeners were done because they took like a four-hour break, but they're back blowing the blower. Awesome. So today we are going to have an amazing and super fun interview with Jens H. Is how we're going to say his name right now. Although I think I nailed his last name since the show. He is a Swedish translator of literature for publishing houses. He takes books in other languages and turns them into Swedish. And you will find out why he is here in just a bit. But first! Yeah, yeah, it's time. It's time you did the thing. It's time you gave... This show, one, two, three, four, five stars. All of the numbers between one and four, don't do those. Just the five. Five stars on iTunes. If you're listening to this on the tubes, hit the thumb, hit the share, hit the comment, hit the like. I think I already did that. Subscribe, duh, and all that other shit. And also, join the fucking crew, guys. Anarchy Crew Faux Life is how... The cool kids in 1997 said things, and they were only copying the cool kids from 1989, am I right? Okay, so let's get on with the show, Graham, here. First things first, Blood Rag Issue 8, out now. We have Rich Boucher, T.T. Conley, Matt Wall, Robert Fleming, B.L. Kohler, and Shaylin Marks in the Blood Rag. Only a dollar. What else are you going to fucking do with a dollar? Seriously, what are you going to fucking do with a dollar? Nothing. 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 So, just do the thing. Um, and, exciting, my new chapbook's out. Poems about fucking by me, Matt Wall. 40 pages, 14 poems, rose gold metallic mirrored cardstock with newsprint interior in a in a different colored tissue paper uh end pages in here i guess is what we're going to call these and it is limited to 60 copies signed and numbered and was there anything else about this i needed to say since they're so slick you could read this in bed and not have to worry about getting it all sticky you could just wipe it off Wipe it off on the sheet, like like an old pro, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I think that's it. That's out on my Etsy shop now as well. Yeah, so I think that's it. That is driving me absolutely fucking crazy. But because it is, let's get right to those motherfucking shout-outs. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons over a Patreon. Big thank you to Chase, to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. Thank you guys so much. You guys are awesome. And I want to give a big thank you to those motherfuckers in the thank you crew. Patrick, Britt, JH, Jessica, Jan, and thank you the other. I appreciate it while you're there. And then um, over at the Anarchy crew, a big, big, big thank you to... To Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Lisa, to Josh, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Tim G, and to Chill Baby. Thank you so much. And the biggest thank you of all the thank yous from Thank You Town goes to the number one chappy at the Chapbook of the Month Club, where you will be getting this book sent to you a number one very shortly and that is the sdg thank you you are the shit thank you thank you all right so now without any further papoo let's get on with the show (laughs) 
how did you come into translating? Well, <laughs> long story. I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> uh, condense it. But um, I was uh, originally I wanted to become an interpreter. And okay. uh, I've always been like interested in languages and blah 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 blah. Like that's what all the people say. Like all the translators say that. Like I was always interested in languages, and uh, but I was. Uh, and uh, then I studied for a short while to become an interpreter, actually a sign language interpreter. <laughs> mm. And uh, it was very interesting. But uh, I uh, changed my mind after a year, and then I just went to university and. Uh, after I had been there a year, I got my first job as a translator when I was 20. And that's really strange because I was so young, <laughs> but I somehow I managed to. And then I, tra I, was, I was at a nuclear power plant uh, <laughs> in my hometown. And uh, so I worked there on and off uh, for a few years. And then finally, I... I uh, started translating in 2015 uh, novels and like literature stuff books <laughs> and uh, and when and, you were uh, doing that were you doing that just for yourself or were you doing that as like a job as a job okay yes so I just uh, I had no idea how to go about it how to sort of start doing it but I knew I wanted to because I've always been a reader and so yeah. um so it's like it's a natural thing to sort of I didn't want to become an interpreter anymore. And I've always been a reader. So translation was kind of a very natural thing to 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 come to mind. And uh, and so and then I just send I send letters actually to a bunch of publishers. I think I have sent uh, like 300 letters at this point, like <laughs> just uh, with my resume and blah 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 and uh, but uh, on my first attempt i uh, got a, a job because nice. actually there was a, a translator who had uh, passed away oh okay and in 2015 and so i and they needed to replace him quickly and they had just gotten my letter there and this was a swedish publishing house and uh, so i get got to tra translate like a couple of pages so they saw that it was i was serious and like really could do this. And then I got a 700 page novel in my mailbox <laughs> a few weeks later. And that's where I've been since then. <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, that was, uh, that was an ordeal. Yeah. It was a Norwegian novel and it's covered like the entire 1900s in Norway, like, but told through different individuals. Yeah. And uh, so uh, tons and tons of different topics because Norway is quite different from Sweden in some ways. Like they have a, a different things happened in their history. Like they were part of the war, the World War, Second World War, and we weren't. And they had the, had the oil, we don't, obviously. And um, so a lot of things to sort of research and look into. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's that story. So <laughs> when, when you are translating something, what is the most important thing for you? Is it just getting the words down the way they sound they should be? Or are you looking more into what someone's trying to say? Uh, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Like I tried to summarize this to a friend uh, uh, a while back. Basically, like I find that uh, translation is always like a mix of uh, of different strategies. Yeah. Sometimes you are like mirroring, you are essentially copying. And sometimes you are like really, really paraphrasing something like it's really, really different. And sometimes you use these strategies like in the same sentence, you can use both of these things, especially when you translate from Norwegian, because the difference between Swedish and Norwegian is dialectal. Yeah. It's like they it isn't really separate, separate languages. And so that I think that. I guess my answer is that it depends. It depends a lot on the text and it depends a lot on the situation. Like for example, when now that you and I are talking, I this is the kind of situation that uh, will allow it for more freedom for the translator. Like whenever I talk to the, the author, they always yeah. like, oh, you can just change that. And they were always very open to correcting mistakes and like uh, things like that. 
So, so have uh, you had an have you had an author who was really on your case about stuff and hard to work with? Yes. Oh my God, I had. There was this. Uh, I'm not going to name him. I'm not going to say his name this time because uh, he doesn't deserve that. Oh my God! And he he actually said that uh, uh, I have to read the entire translation and you have to change it according to my my what I say and um, otherwise i won't allow them to publish it and at the time i was not sure about my what's my situation in this but apparently swedish translators have a very good like uh, the contracts that we use make make the legal situation very beneficial for us so yeah. i i could just say no i could just but i didn't know at the time and uh, so he went, he uh, made a tons and tons and tons and tons of changes. And he's like one of those guys who uh, thinks he is very good at Swedish, but he doesn't at all. Like, uh, <laughs> and it's difficult to pick examples, but he, he uh, there were a lot of things that he wanted me to translate word for word. And it's not always possible from, from Norwegian. It's actually strangely impossible like it's yeah. uh even though they, they are so close you can, it's you can rarely do that and, yeah. but he wanted to always and uh, then something happened that sort of rectified the whole thing if that's how you use the word rectify i don't know and uh, yeah because he's also a translator actually uh, and he translated the poems uh, the most recent poems by louise glick when she was awarded the nobel prize and there was a critic who <laughs> absolutely massacred his translation uh, because uh, it was so bad. And uh, so now, uh, yeah. like the entire world, well, Sweden and Norway know that he is a very bad translator. <laughs> but I mean, he is protected. Like he he has his ego, you know, that sort of. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's not possible to wow. attack him. But uh, for me, that was really good to say, <laughs> okay, I, he is mad. He is like crazy. And uh, I am not the one at fault here. And like, I was a little bit gaslit, I think. Yeah, for real. Experience. Unpleasant situation. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, how, how this whole thing happened <laughs> is I did a video um, a yeah. while back where I was talking about how I, I didn't understand how translations for poetry could work when the language is what the poet plays with the most you know a lot of the poetry i write doesn't really fall under that umbrella but a lot of the poetry that is widely read does fall under that umbrella so i yeah. was really confused and i was kind of throwing out some bombs and stuff and then you're like whoa 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 listen <laughs> and you were like it's not really like that um send me some stuff and i could show you and so this is the culmination of that is that about yeah. how that went i actually think it can be that way because to me like for, for me it's very deep because translation is such a fluffy sort of thing like it can be so much so it's for me it's it's difficult to to uh sort of like correct someone but yeah. uh, like so I, I i feel that what i what i can do is sort of offer like different perspectives yeah and i think that all perspectives have uh, some validity yeah like i think that every, every there's some truth to everything even like the most frustrated like sort of translation like someone wrote in the comment section like translation is like taking a shower with a raincoat on and like if you investigate that claim further then i'm open to sort of acknowledging the partial truth in that I, i'm not willing to like buy it as a like yeah, categorical and, truth <laughs> and like um i don't know and i think a lot of that comes from people who are writing poetry in a certain way following a certain form to where yeah. if you fall out of that form at all like it's not exactly what it is you know what exactly. I'm saying? Yeah. And this thing here. And so what we said we would do is I would read the poem and then you would read the translation that you did. And then we would talk about that. Correct. Sure. Okay. If that's all right with you. Yeah, that's fine. So um, this first one is all jail is. 
So all jail is, is a place that breeds criminals. All jail is, is a place where people are trained to feel like a lower class citizen. All jail is, is a place to learn politics for the next time you're in jail. All jail is, is a place to punish people stupid enough to get caught without trying to make sure they have the skills to never return. All jail is, is a way to make sure inmates will always fear men in uniform. All jail is, is target practice for those new recruits in their new crisp uniforms so they will be brave enough in the sight of true fear. All jail is, is a joke since when you get out after paying your debt, you still have to pay for that debt with a black mark on your name for the rest of your life till you die. All jail is, is a place to go back to after you can't get a good job since that black mark won't fade and crime is the only answer. All jail is, is a home away from home for the people that society doesn't want in their neighborhoods. All jail is, is an archaic hierarchy that should have been, should have been abolished years and years ago. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle of producing more lifetime criminals. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle for producing more lifetime criminals. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle. All jail is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to hear it. Like I should have asked for that earlier. Because, oh yeah, but I I sort of could could hear it while I was reading it. Like because I've heard you read other poems, so uh, I was very glad that I sort of the thing that I heard when I read it is very close to what you just read. So good, 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 good. Yeah, and in my first attempt in Swedish is following. Ett fängelse är bara en plats där brottslingar fostras. Ett fängelse är bara en plats där människor tränas i att känna sig som lägre stående medborgare. Ett fängelse är bara en plats där man lär sig politiken tills nästa gång man sitter i fängelse. Ett fängelse är bara en plats där människor straffas som är dumma nog att åka dit utan att försöka se till att de är skickliga nog och aldrig åka in igen. Ett fängelse är bara ett sätt att se till att internerna förblir rädda för män i uniform. Ett fängelse är bara prickskytte för nyrekryterna i sina sprillans nya uniformer så att de sen står modiga inför verkliga fasor. Ett fängelse är bara ett skämt. För när man kommer ut efter att ha betalat sin skuld får man fortsätta betala av den med ett brännmärke på ens namn. För resten av ens liv tills man dör. Ett fängelse är bara en plats man återvänder till när man inte har kunnat hitta ett bra jobb eftersom brännmärket aldrig går ur och brott är det enda svaret. Ett fängelse är bara ett hem långt hemifrån för folk som samhället inte vill ha in på knutarna. Ett fängelse är bara en föråldrad hierarki som borde ha avskaffats för många år sedan. Ett fängelse är bara en cykel som upprepar sig och skapar fler livstidsbrottslingar. Ett fängelse är bara en cykel som upprepar sig och skapar fler livstidsbrottslingar. Ett fängelse är bara en cykel som upprepar sig. Ett fängelse är bara. Wow. So thank you for that. It's kind of amazing seeing, like when I read my poem, I don't notice words that repeat as much. And as I was going through hearing you read yours and following it along, I'm like, oh, that word looks like that word. I bet I repeated yeah. that word quite a few times. <laughs> um, okay, so my first question, I guess, would be, in Sweden, is the penal system anywhere remotely like it is here? That was like one of my questions as well. And like that was the thing, the first thing that I wanted to bring up because I don't know and I don't think so. Because uh, uh, I was, uh, as part of like my research, I was uh, my, not my official research, but like, mm -hmm. like an accidental research that made me think of this poem was like a, uh, there's this, uh, uh, this girl on, on, uh, on YouTube and she's so funny. And like a few years ago, I think four or five years ago, for some reason, she started making these videos when, when she would eat like way too much of some sort of edible. And then she would do some sort of makeup, like turn herself into like Ursula from the 
Little Mermaid or something. <laughs> she's so funny. I love her. Uh, and she was in jail at one point. And she started talking about the difference between jail and prison. And I was like, hmm. Yeah. Because we have we have jail in that sense, but it's only like very, very short term. It's like before your trial, you go to jail in Sweden. Yeah. And then we have prison. And but then of course, like the the entire thing that you like associate jail with it's i think that's different because in america obviously like the prison system is something that's um, being discussed a lot for various yeah. reasons and uh, yeah. and the police as well and a lot of those things are very different pr- from how things are in sweden and uh, so so that's like uh, but i don't think that that's something because I use the word I use, it's uh, fängelse, and it means prison, and it normally refers to like after you have a sentence, that's where you go. Yeah. Like, and uh, but I don't think we can do a lot about this. Like, what we can do is sort of inform the reader that your your these are translations of poems by an American poet, and mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then the Swedish reader will know that okay, now the it's the American. Yeah. Um, uh, prison system but uh, but yeah it's gonna be like a big difference there I think yeah it's like on the just the first quick breakdowns on prison to jail like yeah. jail is where you go when you are awaiting trial and all that other stuff but if you get a misdemeanor as opposed to a felony mm-hmm. You can't go to prison on misdemeanors. So you can only go to jail on a misdemeanor. So after your trial's over, if you like got your sentence knocked down or your whatever knocked down to a misdemeanor, you would serve though that time in um, jail. The downside to that is, is that because of the overcrowding of prisons, whatever sentence you get you're usually out in a third of the time whereas yeah. in jail there is overcrowding but you would have to serve like two-thirds of that time I so see. like you actually end up like with a longer stay with a misdemeanor but also misdemeanors can be um, taken off your record and all that other stuff whereas felonies like those are harder to wipe away kind of deal um the other thing that we have that is probably different is we have um, the sheriff's department and then the police department and the sheriff's department kind of take care of counties like clusters of cities and they run the county jails and the deputies who end up on the street and all that stuff when they start out they start as guards in the county jail, whereas police officers oh. are like the people in actual little cities in that county. Yeah. And then at the on the prison side, you just have your prison guards and your wardens. Like it's like a completely different um, kind of thing. And from everything I learned and known about that is that when you're in prison, the guards are nice to you. They treat you fairly well for the most mm-hmm. part, because they know you have nothing to lose. You're already at the end of your rope. Whereas in jail, because these deputies are training, they are a mm-hmm. lot harsher on the people in jail and are constantly doing whatever the fuck they want because they're building up their egos for when they get on the streets i see you know what i'm saying and it's like it's a completely different um mindset you know Mm -hmm. but it's i i was like i didn't even really think about that when i sent that to you um one of the things i was um kind of more looking at when i sent that to you was like are uniforms and badges something that are feared in Sweden or is it more of like a thing where these people work for us and they're here to protect us like how does that work out uh, I mean I can since I've often lived like in areas with cheap apartments I've often been like surrounded by a lot of immigrants and I can tell that uh, 
like people who are immigrants or people who look like immigrants absolutely completely different relationship with the police than the one i have because i sort of when i meet a police like a car like that makes me feel safe but like um (laughs) <laughs> like there was this this uh, episode like this thing that happened uh, a few years back when i was uh, looking at my phone <laughs> and uh, there were was uh, two kids like um, outside it was outside my friend's apartment building and they walked up to me after a while and told me not to call the police because they weren't doing something illegal and they weren't but like the and I realized in that moment, uh, like a uh, very like sort of white guy, naive thing to realize when you're like 24. And because that's, oh my God, I've never felt that way. Like, yeah. and, uh, but it, it's, uh, and, uh, and uh, they were just like, they just assumed that I was suspicious of them. Yeah. When I was just like, and, and so I think that that has a lot to do with your background like the, the, your relationship with the police but i would definitely say that you know, there's a lot of people that you know the they have a very tense relationship with the yeah and then as far as like like having like a black mark on your name like is that a metaphor that works in sweden as well yeah kind of we can um we can have a look at it yeah because we our expression is actually uh what you call it a brand maybe like uh, when you heat yeah. up a metal thing and ktsss, yeah, for like, real. that's what we use. And so we just call it a burn mark. It, it sounds like uh, something you get on accident, but it's uh, it's uh, it's like, um, yeah, when you brand like a horse or something. Well, yeah. we don't do that anymore, obviously. But, but that that's something that, that people would understand from that yeah. burn mark. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So that's, but what I'm thinking is, what I re- what I realized when I translated all this poem is that we have a lot of expressions for like uh, things that have to do with uh, like jail and prison. Like for example, uh, all jail is is a place to learn politics for the next time you are in jail. And uh, and what I've written in English is a place where you learn the politics. And the next line translates literally as until the next time you are sitting inside because we are, that's an expression it means to be in jail yeah and like and but it's just sit inside and it's such a strange thing to have such a just specific meaning but it does yeah and so and I'm like and so uh, on that line i thought that i should use the common expression in swedish i shouldn't like say use the word jail mm-hmm. on that line and so I've actually changed that I, before, like uh, before uh, uh, we started this conversation, I changed it. So I've made <laughs> like <laughs> a little note there. Uh, and so, and I've done that, like. Um, I noticed uh, it on Neighborhood. Oh like, yeah, I've done that. That's also like, um, we can skip there. That's also a tricky situation because uh, when we talk about neighborhoods in Swedish, uh, we actually talk about blocks. Okay. And so, like, if I if I want to say uh, that's my neighborhood, I in Swedish I would say those are my blocks. Yeah. And so, and first of all, there is no difference between neighborhood and neighborhoods, and okay. so uh, so that's one one consequence. And then, uh, but I and that's the thing that I've written, like in uh, I don't know if you do you have the translations in front of you? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's in kind of like yeah. a gray. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. the gray part is like the blocks. Uh, yeah. uh, like if I if I would choose that instead, I still have that there. I see. But I, instead, I use like a like an expression that means that came very naturally to me when I wrote this translation. Yeah. Uh, and it means uh, it's a word that means the corner of your house. Okay. And uh, and so what this means is for the people that society does not want close to the corners of their house okay. but it's an expression that means you don't want it like uh, not in my backyard that kind yeah. of uh, you don't mean it literally like yeah. that kind of expression and uh, and so uh, and i was like and this is a situation that i often end up in like when i when i find an expression that fits really neatly into the text and sort of makes it sound 
like more Swedish, and but it isn't exactly what the original says. Yeah, and it's like I'm not doing anyone any favors by not using that expression. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I, I, uh, but this isn't like the best example. This line, but it's like one of the situations where <clears> I'm like, <throat> I should say like the blocks expression, but I but why? When I well, can use this one. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Like, um, I notice that the term lifetime criminals, yeah. like, and it looks like you have one word for that. Yeah. Is is that the same word or is that? Yep. Oh, okay. So that's just how that word. Yeah. Translates. Because, uh, okay. In Sweden, in uh, in English, you, you li- really like to do this thing where you just put a l- bunch of nouns after each other like lifetime criminals. And uh, in Swedish, instead, we just turn them into long words. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Which is equally silly, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, No, that makes yeah, sense. No, that makes sense. So, yeah, that's a... But uh, one thing that we can talk about uh, in this poem is uh, the title <laughs> and the recurring line, which is uh, quite different from the, from the, uh, from the original. Uh, because I'm... Uh, I'm I'm calling it a uh, prison is just okay, <laughs> and that's like I really didn't want to use that, but it's like I could tell like from the second I looked at this poem, I could tell that yeah, I know it's one of those things where it's like you can tra- translate it like word for word, yeah. but people are going to think that it sounds a bit weird, and yeah. they are definitely going to think oh that's just English. But he has just translated word for word. Why did he do that? And people are going to be mad. But when I'm talking to you, like uh, maybe you don't want changes like that. I don't know. No, uh, that's, that that totally don't... makes sense because, like, like my whole thing is like simplicity, like how yeah. to make something accessible to everybody as simply as possible. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like with poetry and especially people translating poetry, that's where a lot of people are going to get pissed off. Like a lot of poets would get pissed off because like I could totally understand exactly why that's how you would word that. That makes Mm -hmm. perfect sense to me. And if that makes it a thing that is accessible to the people who are reading that, then that's exactly what I want. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's fascinating actually. So you put all prison is just. Uh, a prison is just. A prison is just. Uh, but we okay. could, I mean, maybe I could. Uh, I'll t- well, let me ask you this question. Does the word just no. have the same alt- double meaning that it would in English? Like, um, ha- as a part of justice, like that is just? No, it doesn't. But okay, then there's then actually some... There's actually something going on in this translation that kind of alludes a little bit to that. Uh, it's the ending, okay? Uh, because, uh, like, when we, it's a you have this repetitive thing. I think mm-hmm. it works really well. Uh, all jail is is a repetitive cycle. All jail is, and in Swedish, it's et fängelse är bara en cykel som upprepar sig. Et fängelse är bara, and that's like it's kind of means. Like when you, when you put that final line isolated like that, mm-hmm. it kind of means uh, jail just is. Yeah, and it's but when you put it like this in with words in this particular order, like in Swedish, I think to me it puts the emphasis more on the is. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, uh, and it's like uh, and to me it sounds like the translation is saying that uh, prisons are like these this. Uh, the way you have described them in the poem, and that's the only way they are. Yeah, and like, and like, it's like the final line is saying they exist, and they are, and it implies that they are doing this, and they are not doing anything else, namely like taking more responsibility for the people in them or something yeah. like that. Like, well, I noticed and, when you read it, like when you read the last, is it Bara? Yeah. How you say it like when you hit that like on the last one when you say it you come up on your inflection so is that to like hit that home oh uh, i don't know i don't think so but people usually say that about the swedish language that it's it's a bit like that okay but i don't know maybe 
or maybe I said it differently before. Wow, it's so yeah. crazy because, like, honestly, the things that I thought we would be talking about on this poem, like we we talked about a little bit, we touched on them, but there's all yeah. this other stuff that, like, I had Absolutely. no idea about. There's so that's, much. That's amazing. <laughs> but it's like. Uh, yeah, and all these differences, to me, what it amounts to, like a lot of people would say that, oh, this is like where the translation couldn't do its job. Like, <laughs> this is like where it couldn't like completely emulate the orig original. That's yeah. where the translation is sort of wrong or lacking. But like I said, when we discussed this the first time, like in in the comment section, like I think that translation is uh, belongs more in the same category as movie adaptations and yeah. paraphrases and yeah, like for that. real. And, I mean, it belongs and, uh, to the people who are reading it in the language that it's in. Yeah, and, I think that that's a very and, sound way of looking at it. And like when this, when I sent this one to you, there was a part of me that was like, I, I want to know, like, A, if there is the same kind of problem in Sweden that there is here. And if that's something that people in Sweden would be able to relate to. Or is this interesting enough to someone in Sweden to find out yeah. what it's like here? You know what I'm yeah. saying? So if it's something where the Swedish reader would be able to take something from it and kind of look at their own um, society, then that's perfect, you know? But yeah. if it's not, then it's like, is this worth doing as a historical piece of America? You know, like, does yeah. anyone give a shit? And that's a very good, I think that's a very, very good, like, way to look at translation. Like, because a lot of people ask the question, is it possible? But I think that, is it interesting? Or is it relevant? Or whatever, however you want to put it. I think that's a mm. much more relevant question. Like, uh, that's, because we already know it's impossible. Like, yeah. some someone said that uh, translation is impossible in theory, but possible in practice. And I don't know what they meant by that, but it just sounds true to me. <laughs> like, yeah, well, because like you can... when when you talk about like poetic meter and stuff like that, like yeah. I don't know how you can stay in meter on a poem in a different language when words will carry a different amount of syllables. As a poet who's going to be precious about their fucking shit, I don't know how a fucking poet can like be okay knowing that their thing that they worked really hard on to make sure it fit in this exact way is just going to go and like be obliterated when it gets translated and that's when i'm like your words have to fucking matter yeah you know like your your intent has to matter more than the fucking little vase you put the flowers in you know what i'm saying that's true if you want to, we could go on a little tangent uh, because I translated some formal poetry, but just a few, few lines. Oh, yeah, totally. By uh, Yeats, because there was a, a colleague of mine who who uh, had like one of his, uh, and it was so it was so awkward because we have this mailing list. In uh, Swedish translators have like a mailing list. It's very like two thousand and one, but. Okay. We have one still, and it's also a forum online, so you can choose however you want to read the, the things that people post. Yeah. And uh, and it's like uh, there was a translator, a really experienced translator, who uh, had, there was a, a part of a poem by Yeats in her in the book that she was translating, and she was asking like if it was if someone had already translated it, and then she could use like the exist the official or existing yeah. translation of that poem, and then. <laughs> I found it and gave it to her. And I was like, it's not very good. <laughs> and I'm sorry to that translator if they are listening now, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> and then I, so I emailed uh, my colleague uh, separately and said that, you know, this, uh, the one, the, the poem that I sent you, the translation, it isn't very good, is it? No, it's not, she said. And then I made my own attempt. And the, uh, so I can read my and explain my own how I did it. Yeah, for sure. Then uh, when we do discuss these things, it's easier to, to yeah. sort of take one of my own examples rather than bringing someone else in. So here it is. And the original sounds like this. Earth is beauty dressed, awaits returning spring. All true love must die 
alter at the best into some lesser thing. I hope that was intelligible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then, um, and then in in, in Swedish, uh, jorden bär en skrud av liv den hållit inne. Den kärlek som ej dör övergår till slut i bästa fall i minnen. And uh, <laughs> it's actually all right. It's I mean I I was like I thought it was going to be worse, and it's like, and so we can take it line by line because uh, it's so so few lines. Yeah, Earth is beauty dressed, and in my translation is, uh, Earth wears its clothing, awaits returning spring, of life that it it has kept inside, like life it has kept inside. It's like yeah, spring, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, all true love must die. The love that never dies, uh, alter at the best, uh, will eventually transition into uh, into some lesser thing, uh, into memories in best in the best case. So it's like the. <laughs> It's so, but it, but uh, I mean the point here is to illustrate the like it's completely different. I mean, if, yeah. even if it was difficult to follow, you can sort of tell that it was every line was very different for real. But it has like the I did the whole you know badum 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 you know the yeah yeah and counting the syllables and everything, and and then I also want to do it to not just to be like match the. Uh, like the number of syllables and things like yeah. that. I also wanted it to sort of be in in, a, in in some sort of harmony with how the Swedish language works. Yeah, and it's kind of easy from because uh, Swedish and, and English they work similarly in this way. They have a the sort of basic rhythm is it's the same. Uh, yeah, so it it's uh, I had to work a lot on it. I made seven attempts and then I gave up. And then the next morning I woke up and I was like, oh, that's how I'm going to do it. And then I did it and I sent it to her. And it's, okay. I think it's going to be published. And, oh, but, nice. Um, so, I mean, that yeah. that kind of like trips me out in the sense of like you were able to hit the cadence and the like, I guess, the meter of that poem then. Um, yeah. And in doing so, do you feel like any of the translation you made when you make it into English to explain it to me, do you think that an English reader reading that like that would be offended at the choices that you made? I think so, because uh, uh, what I couldn't sort of convey now that I explained the translation is that I have also chosen words that are like, Yeatsy, if you yeah. see what I mean, like, and I did the same thing with your poems, like, and that kind of answers the question that you asked before, like, what's more important? And it's like the the general feeling of exactly Yeatsness, yeah. and it's like, and and like you and you pinpointed the sort of Matt Wallness because it has to do with accessibility, which I think it's a bit like I think I think that <laughs> I mean I don't know at least when you talk about it in, in Swedish it's it can sound a bit insulting but I don't think it is I don't mean it as like I don't mean it doesn't mean simple yeah uh, no 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 not but, at all but like just being said in a way that like makes sense to you and edifies you you know what I'm saying absolutely yeah and that's uh, and that's sort of the and that's the thing that I it's very difficult to sort of convey when I paraphrase it like a translation back into English like that because that's I mean, really interesting though so the word accessibility in Swedish is there's a negative connotation to that yeah definitely <laughs> really yeah oh my gosh I never would have known that yeah at least uh, I mean I'm basing it on uh, I mean when we say accessibility like a building is accessible or something like that then of course it's possible yeah. but when you talk about art then it's like uh, because that's something that I that's actually part of the reason that I was sort of drawn to your channel because it's accessibility and quality all in one like <laughs> oh nice, nice. and uh, and and uh, but uh, whenever I, I bring accessibility up to thing like Swedish poetry nowadays, it's just uh, 
very esoteric and very like uh, oh, yeah you know what i mean yeah like everything is like uh, ezra pound and uh, like those get that kind of poetry like i like ezra pound but uh, but i uh, because i can't really think i don't read like uh, that kind of poetry in english i i'm very like uh, drawn to the the more accessible stuff and whenever i bring this up like either with uh, people in literature or people in the theater it's like in art, art uh, then it's uh, it's always like uh, some sort of in- instinctive reaction to sort of tell me that I'm not that I'm wrong, but like they become a bit like defensive, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. And uh, like there was there was a friend of mine. He oh no, I shouldn't mention that. It's too private. <laughs> but uh, but there uh, but uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a lot of poets like today who who like complain like oh this poem doesn't have enough resistance. Like that's something that people mention a lot, and it's like, and by resistance, I think they mean like things need to be a bit more obscure. Yeah, <laughs> like, and, and that's that's a big sticking point for me because, like, to me, something having to be obscure means that you're purposefully keeping something from the reader, and it's like, why? Like, why are you trying to hide? Like whenever anyone talks about anything like that in the real world, that would be deception. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, why are you purposefully deceiving the reader here? Like what, Mm -hmm. what's the point behind that? And I've never understood that personally. Yeah. It could be like, like, I think that a lot of people, when they have like valid complaints about accessible poems or literature or anything, then what they, what like, I think that a really valid thing to say is that the the writer is doing everything for me like i i don't get to do any like interpretation for myself like i need to that's and that's something that a reader needs and maybe that's part of it is it they don't want to give everything away is it something that the reader needs or is it something that the reader slash critic has to talk about with another reader uh, I don't know. Can that's you... the thing that always like trips me out. Cause I feel like a lot of times when people want something obscure or something like that, they do that. So then they can write a blog post about it or talk about it at a party with somebody else and sound really fucking smart because they figured out what this actually means. And like, Oh, well, I think it means this. Oh, well, you're clearly wrong, sir. Let me tell you why. And it becomes this whole thing. And it's like, is that the most important thing in the poetry or do you really need to solve a puzzle? Like, do you want to fucking read Agatha Christie and just fucking figure out who done it what are you trying to get at when you are reading poetry like what is your what's the thing that makes you come to that do you come to that to see someone bear their soul or do you come to that because you want to prove to yourself that you can figure out something and i'm not trying to say this in a way that sounds Mm -hmm. shitty but i'm very much doing so but like i just like i i don't understand people's insistence on that other than for praise from others yeah yeah i do i do think that sort of like resistance or whatever you want to call it that it sometimes seems like it exists for its own sake yeah but what i'm thinking of is like like at one point i was proofreading i do proofreading and editing and things like that sometimes but and then uh, i was proofreading uh like a feel-good uh, kind of romance uh, novel at one point and it's that has been very interesting like reading those kinds of books because I'm a snob I never do <laughs> and so and uh, and there was this scene where you have this all of these first of all you have the expectations on the genre like yeah. you know how it's going to end yeah and and then you also have like there was this writer she had like described a situation between there was a nurse uh, he she started working at a, a hospital in this novel and then they you know enter the handsome doctor and and you, everyone knows what's going to happen next yeah and there is this tension building up between them blah 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 and then the the a writer she added this sentence which uh, which was something like i am starting to feel more and more attracted to him full stop and it's like, I know. I mean, I've read the previous chapters, and and so that's the kind of uh, 
Uh, and I think that's a very valid uh, criticism to have, yeah. you know, when you're when you're when you're annoyed by accessibility. Yeah, like, for real. And I uh, I don't remember if I said anything about it because yeah, that's, that's not just like, like that's just like hitting it over the head, you know, like yeah. And, and like so, the be- the better line would have been when the doctor comes in, he says to her, "You have gonorrhea." So I hope you enjoyed that first part. There will be a second part. Oh shit! I should have said this at the beginning. I might have to fit, blah, 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 flip this around. But episode fifty. It's the A M A E. It is the ask me anything else, anything other than all the other shit you guys normally ask me. Go ahead and send that in. We will be doing that on Friday, I think. So make sure you get your questions in before then. Might do it Thursday, but I really don't want to. So let's see if we'll do it Friday, okay? And yeah, and then that way I could ask them on episode 50, which will come out on Saturday. And then um, we will either do the next part for this on the following Wednesday or the following Saturday. Haven't decided exactly how that's gonna work out. There's a lot of editing that needs to be done. So we will see. And I have some great interviews coming up. So um, I'm excited, you're excited, we're all excited. So let's get into the rest of um, B-Town with the butt plugs. And again, poems about fucking, out now. Pick it up at my Etsy shop. Blood Rag, Issue 8, out now, at my Etsy shop, and a bunch of other things. Um, Keep in mind, too, that on, oh, fuck, what day is it? Uh, February 16th, 17th, somewhere around there, um, I'm going to be hosting the new Open Mic Night, Poetic Anarchy with Matt Wall, through the the Word is Right network um, I don't know exactly what they call them. I should I should find that out. I will probably find out this weekend. So, and that will be um, every first and third Thursday of the month. And that will be at 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern in the afternoon slash evening. If you guys are interested in participating, I will have more info the closer we get to it. And with that said... Keep an eye out because the crowdfunding campaign is going to start in March for my new poetry collection, The Biggin, okay? And it is called Winner of Your Mom's Sodomy Prize for Poetry, okay? So um, that will be there, and I will be having more news on the small press here shortly, Because that is a train that's just moving, and I can't stop it. And it's just rolling down the hill now. And it's picking up steam. There's nothing I can do. I just gotta strap myself in and hang on for the ride. As you all do. So again, if you have some mentorship stuff you want to talk about, you can hit me up or check out IHateMountWall.com slash mentorship. If you have any questions or comments, especially the AMAE questions, you can send those to IHateMountWall at gmail.com. And if you don't know how to get to my Etsy shop and are unfamiliar with how to scroll down and look into the show notes, you can just go to IHateMountWall.com and look for the shiny rose gold cover that says Poems About Fucking. And then I'll take you to my Etsy shop. Okay? So... Without any further, oh wait, no, that's this is the end of the show. Okay, so keep buying my books, everybody. Pick up the blood rag, type hard, everybody, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.